over um, basically how we manage data at, at BDRC. I'll do a sh very short introduction for everybody, just to uh, our organization and what we do. And then this, uh, you know, I was talking to Nathan about this, this kind of interesting kind of perspective or angle, uh, this conference, um, because it allows us to talk a little bit more of a higher level about how we're actually managing all the data and what kinds of data, what we mean by data, the types of data and so forth. Um, this is an 18 year project. So we've created a lot of data and all the issues of scale and workflow and all those things. We've made all the mistakes um, and struggle for uh, many years, especially um, in 1999 uh, in the dark ages of the internet. So um, it's been, uh, so we want to elucidate a, a lot of the uh, methods that we've used in terms of how we manage the, uh, the information and what kinds of information we're talking about. Um, this project was founded by Gene Smith in 1999 as Tibetan Buddhist Resource Center. Um, in 2015, we changed our name to the Buddhist Digital Resource, Resource Center. It's going to expand our impact um, and the kinds of material we're working in. Uh, we focus on text, textual resources, and metadata. Um, we don't get into audio or video or anything like that. Um, so basically what we do is digitize source material through partnerships or through our own digitization programs uh, with scanning centers, uh, field, we do a lot of field work. Um, and then we curate the source material using scholarly validated metadata, it's an important part, this is a major interest of genes, um, not just um, standard library cataloging, but um, um, more scholarly va validated documentation. And then we make everything, we preserve, make everything publicly accessible um, and uh, also uh, back things up in a long-term preservation uh, platform. So our current status here, you can see down here, this is year 2016, this is millions of images. So we're at about 13.6 million images, primarily in Tibetan, but also increasingly in Pali, uh, Sanskrit and Chinese. And uh, we also, um, our website is a, a is global platform, um, 200,000 online sessions a year, and we just released an app in the App Store and Android. Uh, and then everything we do is preserved in Harvard DRS, and I'll go through a little bit of what that means. Um, what, kinds of meta, what kinds of data are we talking about? Um, digital text resources. You could say digital assets. Those are the assets we're managing. And then metadata about those assets. And then source code. Um, Ellie's going to talk about uh, metadata and source code. Source code actually is where there's a lot of business rules, what's called business rules in software development, um, that are implemented in the software. They're not in the metadata. They're not in the resource that you're managing. They're implemented in the source code. And um, so you have to keep track of that as well and where those business rules are. Um, so these are kind of digital text resources, images of text using open source standard formats as much as possible, but also page uh, transcripts. I'll go through a little bit about t how we use TEI, issues with TEI, and then our multi-layer architecture. So the types of data here, um, metadata also, um, documents that describe digital assets. Um, the metadata itself becomes so rich that it becomes even the definition of it as metadata starts to blur. Um, this, is, this is data that's worthy in, a, in and of itself of curation, of, of, of sorting, storage, and so forth. So metadata is critical for accessibility, management, and preservation. Um, and then also the source code, manage the digital assets. There's a whole apparatus of software that manages all the digital assets, makes them discoverable, organizes them and archives them, um, and also connects the metadata to the digital assets, <coughs> and it makes them discoverable. So scale, um, I've heard a little bit of discussions of scale. Um, scale for us is critical. Um, it impacts um, basically every decision you make, what metadata format you use at all, how much metadata you put into, uh, uh, how much metadata you actually use, um, um, workflow systems, how you visualize and present information. If you have like faceted brows, 
if you have 40 texts, you know, there's a limit to the amount of information that the user will see on the screen. If you have 450,000 texts, you know, it's a very different scenario. So the, the scale is really important and, and it really defines how you implement what you're trying to do. Um, so our, our scale is that actually 13.6 million images, that's actually 31.2 uh, million um, total digital assets. So that's all the, um, the, the, the uh, web delivery images, but also archival images. And then page transcripts, we have uh, 17,000 text documents. So that's the scale right now of what we're, what we're doing. Um, scale of the metadata, 160,000 records, items, persons, places, topics, which equals, and we'll go into, Ellie's going to talk a little bit about RDF, that's about 10 million triples, and 450,000 individual work objects. So that's um, out of the items in the library, it's about 450,000 individual works. Um, in the source code, 220,000 lines of code in our current platform, and right now we're developing an open source platform in Git, which is GitHub, which is uh, 25,000 lines of code. So I'll go a little bit about, um, do, talk a little bit about data management of the digital resources, kind of get into the weeds a little bit because this stuff matters when you're at scale. Every single thing you do in terms of how you name your files, what directory structure there is. We've had four major migrations of our, um, of our whole digital archive. And um, so now uh, we have a mirrored, um, mirrored architecture, local storage with uh, web del deliveries on Amazon Web Services, AWS and S3 buckets and backups. We have RAID 5 for local storage, actually mirrored. So it's actually uh, four backups. Um, and then it's also mirrored at the Internet Archive. We're building that platform right now. And then our long-term preservation backup is at Harvard. So I'm just kind of rifling through this stuff here just to give you a, a, a sketch of what we're doing. Um, this is uh, our, um, our architecture. Um, we have the local storage here uh, mirrored to S3 bucket and AWS, which is made available Will, will be made available through a triple IF service to image clients directly or to a whole series of applications. So we've spent a lot of time with software development and we have five software developers now. Um, so yeah, it's one of these kinds of, that's the scale of what we're doing. Directory structure, it's like, these are item IDs. So we, when we started, um, we had uh, a couple thousand um, images, and then we had 10,000 and 100,000 and then a million, and at each time things started to break and we had to kind of keep track of things. Um, so now everything is in S3 and uh, it's quite nice. Um, this is totally unique. We had to break up this long list of uh, directory structure into buckets. Um, so this is uh, very stable now, um, all unique. Um, down to the individual TIFF number or image number. Who did the presentation on the file naming? <laughs> okay, these are rock solid um, <laughs> and unique on the internet if you take the whole path. So policies, how do we make stuff accessible? Big thing we've worked on is we differentiate license and access. So we worked with a copyright activist at the Harvard Library, who is very much, um, obviously has much more of an interest in making things accessible than restricting them and, and kind of concerned with cultural heritage projects that are using copyright in ways that aren't necessarily appropriate. For instance, if you have an image of a public domain text, that's not copyrightable. The image is not copyrightable. So we had to, we have about 75% of our libraries in the public domain. So we had to deal with this. What we were doing before is we were restrict. We, we didn't have a mechanism to restrict access, so we copyright restricted. So when we went to Harvard and said, "Well, we want to give you all of our scans for long-term preservation," they said, "Well, what's the license on this?" And we said, "Well, it's copyright." And then you do a copyright analysis on it, and it's like, "Well, no, it's not copyright because that's a public domain material." But we said, "Well, uh, the people that gave us the text don't want it publicly accessible." So then we needed to find a way to differentiate between the license, the legal 
designation of the asset and then its access. So we came up with this, um, which is um, separating license and access public domain uh, and copyright, uh, and then a set of cultural restrictions based on the uh, owners of the traditions and um, what they want uh, restricted or not. This is very uh, managed by us, basically, um, and um, it works to a certain extent. Right? A lot of people want these texts, so um, we do not have a very strict way of, um, of, of providing access, except you know, basically you have to contact us. Accessibility, um, we have a whole web application framework for serving up images and an authentication for access control. Um, so I'll get into this, uh, actually, how much time do I have? 15 minutes. Okay, so Ellie's gotta talk too. So, um, so not only scans, but transcribed text produced from OCR and transcriptions and digital editions. Um, so our current e-text repository is in TEI. Um, so um, I am not a proponent of TEI. And um, the reason is, is that TEI is very strong semantically, but it's expressed as XML. So you can imagine a case where there are different XML formats. So how do XML formats overlap? They don't. So the most simple semantic breakdown is of page. So if you have a page um, and then you have an outline that breaks, that goes across the page, it's very difficult to express that in XML. So you have a lot of workarounds with uh, uh, non-breaking um, tags, uh, milestone tags. Um, and uh, in our case, with 17,000 documents, um, it's very difficult to manage um, different text documents that have different TI customizations. So the interoperability and the, the, the lack of overlap of XML. So my, our problem with TI is not that it, the semantics of TI, it's actually the XML of TI. So kind of a way forward um, where you use the TI he header as metadata uh, pointing to um, basically the TI body, which is the asset, and then the tags in the TI body encode the character position um, in a text stream. So this is our multi-layer architecture, which looks like this. You have the metadata in a linked data Git repository, and there's a base layer, which is just the ID and a stream of text. And then we chunk that up and serve it up to our search engine. And this is our search application that's written on top of that. So this scales for uh, an infinite number of texts. Um, and then we have, uh, this is actually under the hood. You do the same thing as if you have uh, language analyzers, which look at different languages, and this is using the Apache Lucene framework. Um, so the multi-layer kind of looks like this. You have a, basically a table structure here, and then you have a JSON file here. Actually, this is Turtle, and you can't read it, but basically it, it says that this slice number uh, is on line one, uh, and the start character is here, and the end character is here. So you can basically, these are all layers that point in to your raw text. So what we want to get, what, how we're <coughs> doing this is that you're going to have text files which are raw text, and uh, your layers point to the raw text. And when you do this, you can have an infinite number of layers pointing to the same base text. So there's no uh, collision. Um, and then there's semantics involved with each of these, uh, each of these um, layers here expressed in this RDF file. So that's our multi-layer architecture. Um, and then, okay, so metadata. So uh, Ellie's gonna talk a little bit about metadata. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is the way we design our metadata in our new platform. So it's quite, uh, it's not finished yet, and it's not what you will see on the tbrc.org uh, website. So first, um, the, due to the scale of the data and our idea of a semantic network with, uh, like within our data set, like all the entities should be linked together and also linked to other data sets, 
uh, we think of our data as uh, linked data. So what it means as some <coughs> core requirements is <coughs> that every resource has a persistent ID in the form of a URL. So this URL you see is, for instance, the ID of uh, Jigme Lingpa, the Tibetan person in our database, and it will stay uh, there forever. Um, also, the data needs to be served in a, um, a standard format, like JSON, XML, etc., and with a standard vocabulary. And um, the way to do that in terms of technology is uh, through RDF. I mean, RDF is a format that's been designed for, to meet these kind of requirements. And uh, so that's what we do. So we, we use RDF to have persistent IDs and uh, standard formats. And uh, for the standard vocabulary, we have designed a role, which we call the Buddhist Digital Ontology. And it aims at being um, a standard for um, in the Buddhist field, so that any other project can uh, use this standard or at least uh, uh, convert its data to this standard and link uh, to our data in a very semantic way. And um, so that's a work in progress. We are documenting our vocabulary and we are uh, hoping to release a final, uh, maybe not final, but at least a public version with some documentation maybe in January or February, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so now in terms of the data themselves, um, uh, we have um, different documents, like one document per person, per work, per place, etc., which uh, is in RDF, and we serialize it in a um, total format. Uh, so it's a standard RDF uh, way of representing uh, a file. So it's human readable, it's a plain text file, and uh, it's uh, uncompressed, and uh, thanks to this, uh, uh, properties, we can um, have these different files in uh, Git repositories. So this allows us to have versioning of uh, all the different um, resources and also versioning on the type level. Like we have uh, a Git repository for uh, the persons, for instance. <coughs> uh, we have sort of a version for the whole data set of persons, which can be quite convenient. And it also solves the backup problems because you just need to clone your repository on different servers and you will have the, all the repository and all the history of all the resources on different servers. So it's backed up very easily. Um, all our uh, Git repositories will be available on gitlab.org. So it's sort of a GitHub platform. And so it will all be publicly available. And uh, so it, you will be able to access it uh, for free. And the... Um, one aspect which is interesting also with, di with Git is the human readable diffs. So if you want to see uh, the ch what changed uh, between like two days or uh, one month, etc., you can see that very easily because uh, turtle format is very human readable. And so when you ask uh, Git to, to show you a diff of all the files, you can see very easily that, okay, this property changed, this name changed, this name was added, etc. So it's quite convenient to, to see what's going on. Um, in terms of access, um, for the read access, all our data or metadata will be under CC0 license, so basically kind of public domain. And there will be, uh, of course, the Git access if you know how to use Git, but also a uh, public interface that you, you can think of as an enhanced version of dbrc.org with more features and more uh, semantic search. Um, in terms of write access, uh, only our staff can write uh, on the data, uh, so that's the current system, but um, we want to, uh, let's say, make it more flexible through a mechanism called annotations. So, I mean, first, the general idea of annotations in our uh, metadata is that every piece of information and every, like, even, uh, like, this person has this name, this is one information that should be, that we want to be able to annotate. And also even the region of an image or a set of, of images or a region of a text, etc. we want to be able to link all that and annotate all that. So for instance, you could say, um, you could use annotations for provenance indication, like, uh, okay, this person has this name, and you can annotate that saying that this person has this name according to this text, for instance, or uh, there's a controversy about the name that you can see in this article, or all sorts of uh, data about the data. 
And um, it can also be used for discussions about the data because you can annotate annotations. So if someone makes an annotation, someone can also comment on this annotation, etc. And um, but the way we want to use it for access is to allow users to uh, propose some changes to the data through annotations. Like for instance, a user could annotate a property of a person, etc., saying there's a spelling mistake in the name, or this is the wrong name, or whatever, or a, uh, a name should be added, and it could, users could propose that through annotations, and then uh, the BDRC staff could have an interface where they could validate or uh, discard the proposed changes. So that's a way to sort of uh, enlarge or um, allow our user base to interact with the data. So in terms of um, source code, um, one important aspect is that due to the semantic nature of our data, we want to make the source code um, read the, the semantics of the data, of the schema, and uh, build the UI and um, business rules from the data, from the schema of the data. So this, uh, in different domains like localization, like in the ontology, you can have the localization of the different properties, like. Uh, this property should be displayed as uh, this uh, English string, Chinese string, etc. So you would have all the different names of the properties. Uh, the data is also semantic in, in as it, uh, it allows you to have rules about inference. Like uh, if you have this and this information, you can deduce also this information. It's, there's all sorts of inference work in RDF and all, etc. So this can be implemented like it's uh, stated in the data, but it's implemented in the source code that will read the data. And um, access control too. I mean, if you have conventions in your uh, ontology and data, the software just reads how to, to handle that in the data and implement the business rules. Um, in terms of um, uh, for our source code, uh, the code we are building is uh, open source, it's under Apache, Apache 2 license, and we only use open source libraries and frameworks uh, that, go, that can work on all different um, OS, like uh, OS X, Windows, Linux, etc. Uh, we contribute as much as possible to um, uh, the libraries we use or the frameworks we use, like for instance, if there's a missing feature, we try to implement it uh, upstream in the framework that we use so that we don't have to write a lot of code, etc. And this can be maintained like outside our, uh, our code. And um, we try to respect, I mean, we what we're trying to do is really build a platform that's production ready. So we are documenting the code, making automatic tests, and make it uh, available on GitHub, uh, have um, correct dependency management, etc. so that it's, um, yeah, it can be used by, I mean, it sort of speaks uh, to other software developers. So it's not just our platform that we are developing for us. Um, also a nice feature we, we've added is uh, build automations. Like if there's a, it's through a software called Vagrant, uh, you can download a script that will automatically like fetch uh, Linux virtual machine, uh, install all the dependencies of our platform, all the source code, all the data, and serve it on your local computer. So, and that's the, the way we ourselves uh, have set up our development uh, platform on our uh, laptops and also on the servers we have. So doing this, you can very easily have a, a complete uh, platform on your laptop and do some search, etc. Very easily. I mean, it's just uh, a matter of uh, launching the script. Yes. So you can stay there. So in addition, I think we're pretty good. Um, maybe two minutes. Yeah. Um, the issue of long-term preservation. Um, all three of these levels, types of data, are preserved long-term. So we go to the next slide, maybe. Um, so um, Harvard Digital Repository Service is our partner for long-term preservation and uh, basically what you have is a series of content models that you publish into and then they handle the obsolescence and the, the digital degradation, the bit rot um, and uh, backups and um, migrations and so forth. 
all of the page images, uh, archival images, as well as web delivery Im images, all the metadata and all the source code. So um, this is important, I think, in, in a lot of um, digital humanities projects to have some sense of long-term preservation. Um, I know a lot of funding agencies are now requiring data management plans in grants. So uh, that's it. We have one minute for questions. maybe six release major releases of our pop digital library so you know we started in 1999 and then really in 2006 we did a major shift in the architecture with new metadata and a whole web platform that delivered images so that was one major release and then in 2009 we implemented full localization of everything um, <coughs> using the same metadata format now this project started basically this year uh, but we've been, yeah, so all of our data before was kind of like RDF ready, but not actually RDF. So now the full move and the semantic web and linked data is now. That's our project now. So, yeah. Some of the uh, technologies that we use are um, open source projects that come out of the box, as it were. Others you developed yourself. I was wondering, and um, when you choose to develop something yourself, and like say your ontology, is it the Buddha and EDA ontology project? When and how is that decision made? And, um, and, and why? Well, it's just if it doesn't exist anywhere, we implement it. But if it exists somewhere, we really want to use uh, mm -hmm. like standard uh, libraries, etc. Like but, the. Yeah, sorry. But I bet you. you Ontologies do exist. Yeah, but not with that level of details we need because um, one aspect is the our our core data is in RDF, so we need um, a way in our ontology to describe all the details we need. Uh, current ontology tend to be quite um, I don't know very small and s more focused on interoperability. Like on schema.org, you have very few properties, and we could, I mean, we could export our data to schema.org ontology, for instance, but we couldn't export all the details. Like everything, uh, like half the data would be lost in translation. So we need something that uh, can really uh, uh, manage all our details of our data. It's a good question, though, but it's actually at the heart of semantic web linked data is that decision when you use a standard standard guideline, guideline vocabulary, common vocabulary versus when you implement your own. So at least there's a framework for that consideration, right? Um, yeah. Uh, I'm also thinking about your know, channel. You know, you mentioned the Apache channel search in the say you've got this very specific, you've got bespoke solution to that. Uh, it works like Jet Pali, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it didn't you like. You've taken a very different approach to that. So I'd no, it just what we are doing is just uh, plugins for the scene. It just didn't exist before. Like there, there was no Tibetan anal analyzer for the scene, and so we are just developing one Tibetan plugin for the scene, and one for Sanskrit, one for Pali, etc. But in a very you did that. You didn't yeah, yeah, it didn't exist. Didn't exist. Yeah. 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 Sorry, we, we, we have to move on. <laughs>